Okay, we've got our speaker Sherry with us. It looks like she might be having some microphone issues. So we'll just give that a minute. All right, looks like we're getting started. Okay, I should. I uh, why is it doing my back camera? <sighs> That's all right. We'll get there. Um. Is there some way, Serena, that I can send email you the deck and then you could just drive the deck and have my voice? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to just um, send that yeah, let to me, me over that. Slack? Me or... Yeah, uh, I was just going to send you an email. Um, sure. Because that's what I've got open right now. That works. Touch a file. Okay, that didn't work. Let me try something else. Okay. Uh, 
plus upload from your computer. Looks like we've got a couple people joining us so far. Um, where are you joining from? Same here. Brett, you were one of the older Salt Stack employees and, and you left for a while and came back, right? I don't think I ever got the chance to meet you. Well, it's nice to finally meet you. Heard good things. All right. Well, it's um, the file is too big and uh, we're starting to cut into some time here and people are here. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just, you know, basically give the presentation. And then if people are interested in the deck afterwards, I can send that to them. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Is the, everyone... de the deck isn't the deck isn't really super essential. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just supports the conversation. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's fine. Let's do that then. Okay. And then for people who are internal, um, we have this uh, to, to VMware, uh, we have some of this information recorded as a tech talk. So you can go to the, um, the tech talks, tech-talks.octo.eng.vmware.com, I think is the um, URL uh, and, and play the whole thing with the deck from there. So I wanted to talk about three different things today. Um, first of all, number one is who needs accessibility. Number two is how is accessibility being enforced? And number three is how do we make things that are digital accessible? Um, people usually think of accessibility in terms of things like curb cuts and um, you know, handicapped parking spaces and wheelchairs and things of that nature. Um, but there's some very well-defined principles behind how to make software accessible, how to make PDF files accessible, and how to make mobile apps accessible. And um, I was very pleased. Uh, usually acquisitions uh, would make me a little bit nervous because I we VMware would acquire a company and then I'd go look online and they had nothing on accessibility. And VMware would acquire another company and I'd look online and they had nothing about accessibility. So when VMware acquired SaltStack, I'm like, yay, they know about accessibility. Um, so I'm pretty sure you know some of the basics, but I want to get into more in depth about the why, because when you know the why, uh, the how becomes much, much easier. So when you think about people with visible disabilities, people usually think about Stevie Wonder and Stephen Hawking and Marley Matlin, who's an actress who uses ASL, uh, people who use wheelchairs, that's actually only 30% of overall disabilities. So when you think about disabilities, you also have to think about hidden disabilities. So for example, Facebook, or I should say Meta now, this color is blue because that's the only color Mark Zuckerberg can see. He's got a rare form of color blindness. Um, Millie Bobby Brown, you know, 13 from Stranger Things is deaf in one ear. Uh, Bono wears rose-colored glasses, not because it's a rock star affectation, but because he uh, has glaucoma. And it turned out he could see better uh, with the, the colored glasses. And he hid that fact for the better part of 20 years. He didn't want anybody to know he had glaucoma because he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to get his tours insured if they knew that he, there was the potential that he might not see the edge of the stage and, and accidentally fall off. So there's real reasons why people have hidden disabilities, but don't necessarily like to talk about them uh, because they can pass as not having a disability and it avoids a situation where they might be discriminated against. So if you're looking at visible disabilities and hidden disabilities combined at a, as a total, you're talking about 
of the U.S. population. But there's other things that you have to worry about with your users where it behaves like a disability, but it's not necessarily a permanent disability. So you might have a permanent disability, like somebody who's being who was born with a limb difference or maybe you know, had a mutation somewhere along the way. You know, I remember the first day of uh, Ragu's, our new CEO's, uh, you know, announcement that he was our new CEO. Uh, he had his uh, arm in a great big uh, sling. It looked like a rotator cuff injury to me. Um, I've had one before. I had to wear the same type of uh, sling. Um, that's a t temporary disability. It's something where it acts like a permanent disability, but it's going to be a shorter period of time. And then you've also got people who might have situational disabilities. If you're holding a bag of groceries or a baby in your right hand, your right hand, for all intents and purposes, isn't there for doing digital operations. So that's called a situational disability. So if you add all of those groups together, hidden disabilities, visible disabilities, temporary disabilities, and situational disabilities, you're looking at about one third of your total population of users. And that's one of the reasons why accessibility is so important. So we've got this alphabet soup of international laws uh, pertaining to accessibility. There's some state laws in California. There's some provincial laws in Canada. There's a, a, a federal law in Canada called the Accessible Canada Act. Uh, there's accessibility laws in Europe, there's accessibility laws in Australia. So that's the bad news is everybody has their own law. The good news is that everybody in, uses the same underlying standard to, to enforce their law. So we're not dealing with Europe having one standard and Australia having a second standard and the US having a third standard. We all have our own laws, but the standard is identical. And the standard is called WCAG, for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or sometimes you might hear it referred to as WCAG. And that is as of version 2.1, which is the current version, it came out about three years ago, there are 50 guidelines. And if you're, oh, you found it. That's awesome. I'm on slide. I eight. did, sorry. I thought I would uh, try and be discreet about it, but <laughs> yes, I've got oh. it pulled up now. Thank you so much, Serena. I'm sorry for the, the inconvenience. I, um, I have to do audio on a separate system than I do video. And uh, I should have thought to try it out on Hop and I didn't. No trouble at all. So uh, common denominator, WCAG. If you're following the strictest WCAG guideline in the world, you're going to be good everywhere. You don't have to worry about, well, the European Accessibility Act says this and the Accessible Canada Act says that. Just follow WCAG. 2.1 level AA. So AA is the intermediate level. Every version of WCAG has A, AA, and AAA. A are the ones that you really have to follow or you're going to be discriminating against a whole group of people with disabilities. AA's are the, if you don't follow these, you're making it hard. And AAA's are the nice to have. Most people don't do AAA, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so 2.1 AA, for right now, you're going to be good everywhere. 2.2 is coming out in February. Most of the time, the courts give uh, companies like VMware and, and Salt 18 months from the time a new guideline is final until the time that they expect it to be implemented. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but 18 months is a really good time frame. So since it's coming out in February of 2022, it means that Pretty much everybody should have uh, WCAG 2.2 implemented by October of 2023. Okay, that's when litigation will likely start referencing 2.2 as the expected standard. So, why do you care about litigation? Well, for those of you in the US, litigation is a real issue. We're a very litigious society. We had 2,200 cases in 2019. Uh, regarding uh, accessibility, we had double that in 2020. And that was in a year where the courts were closed for a quarter of the year. So year over year over year, um, the litigation rates keep on going up. We uh, have you know, four or five law firms, their entire business is about nothing but digital uh, accessibility lawsuits. Um, so it's, it's a real problem. And because the Americans with Disability Act 
has no ombudsman or place that you can file a complaint saying, hey, I need to be able to use that website and it's not accessible, people are resorting to private litigation instead uh, to resolve those issues. So some of the companies that have, you know, who's getting sued? Right now, largely it's retailers. Um, Target's been sued, Domino's has been sued, Hooters has been sued. All three of them lost their cases. It's very, very rare uh, for a, a retailer to win an accessibility case. Um, more often than not, they're losing way over 90% of them or they settle uh, partway through the litigation process. So just to give you an idea, Domino's admitted in their litigation that it would have only cost them $38,000 to make their website accessible. So far, their legal bills have been over $2 million um, to this point. So, you know, to make, to make a point that they really don't think that this law applies to them, they've spent $2 million in legal fees, even though it only would have cost them $38K uh, to fix it in the first place. So sometimes companies, private organizations are enforcing the law. So another list of companies, Microsoft, Amazon, Bank of America, Apple, Chase, United, and now VMware, our preference is to buy accessible software. You can only buy inaccessible software at VMware uh, starting in April of this year if you've gone through a pretty involved exceptions process and you prove that there are no accessible options for the software that you're trying to buy. Otherwise, the expectation is you will either buy accessible software or you will buy software that has an accessibility roadmap that the accessibility team has reviewed and believes in. So we've done, and we work with all of our vendors who aren't accessible. We work with Slack, we work with Zoom, we work with Miro, we work with Workboard. Um, so we have about 40 vendors that we're actively working with right now, the top 40 in terms of number of users to try to help those companies become more accessible. And the great thing is when we do that, and for example, uh, Slack uh, put out an accessibility bug fix that I specifically requested, guess what? Everybody in the world benefits. They don't just put out that bug fix for VMware, right? They put it out there for everybody. So that's where you, where you see who's enforcing it. There, it's either being enforced by lawsuit or it's being enforced by companies that care about disability inclusion. You don't want to be the company who gets sued by one of your employees because they're blind and they can't get a promotion or they can't get a transfer into a job that they're otherwise qualified for because the tools that your organization has chosen to use are not accessible. So uh, just to recap this kind of early introduction section, um, lawsuits in the United States are a primary and expensive form of enforcement. The public sector, government agencies, um, they're getting better at enforcing the rules because people have litigated against them. Uh, one woman filed 38 lawsuits in a single weekend ag against colleges because their application process wasn't accessible, right? So they get money, strings are tied with that money. We want people with disabilities to be able to get educations. Therefore, all of the information on a, a website that, that comes from government money has to be accessible. And finally, you can't claim that you believe in inclusion if you're buying inaccessible products, because if you buy inaccessible products, you're discriminating against your employees with disabilities. So um, that's, that's kind of some important things about the why. And I'll take a small break to answer any questions that people might have before I get into the what. Is there anything that's come into through the chat window, Serena? Uh, let me take a look. Um... Can I just ask, I was sharing the slides, right? I just want to make sure that the view is right. Uh, um, it, it, you, sh you showed the one and then it, it went away. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a problem. Like I I'll, said, put it, the, I'll put it back up. The slides aren't particularly important. Um, you know, this is being recorded. If you hear this recording and you want the slides, um, email, it's S-B-Y-R-N-E-H-A-B-E-R. -E -E so those are both Bs, no hyphen, at VMware.com. And I will be happy to send you the deck. So we are on slide uh, 13, which you were on. Great. Sorry, I couldn't see it. Yeah, I'm just having some issues with present mode. So I wasn't sure if when I went into present mode, it threw things off because it moved it, to a different it, screen. 
it did. So just just stay okay. here and it'll be fine. Yeah, no questions so far. Uh, feel free to post in the Q&A section um, or in the chat, or um, you can request to come off of mute or share video and I can give you that permission as well. Um, yeah, we'll keep going. Okay, so um, I've got some common accessibility guidelines that I'm gonna go through. As I mentioned for 2.1 AA, there are 50 guidelines altogether, but they're very, very content specific. So for example, if you don't have any moving carousels, you don't have to worry about the guideline that pertains to moving carousels. If you don't have any video, you don't have to worry about the five or seven guidelines uh, that pertain to uh, video for closed captioning and descriptive audio. So um, when I was at a previous job, uh, back when we did 2.0 and 2.0 had 38 guidelines, 2.1 added 12 new ones, only 25 of them um, applied uh, to our to the mobile app uh, that we were doing. So the first thing to do if you're doing an accessibility assessment is to go through and figure out which ones actually apply to you and then only focus on those because you don't care about the other ones. The other ones are only of the variety of if you're going to do this, this is the way you need to do it. So the first one we're going to talk about in detail is captions. So we have a, a, a word in the deaf community, which is auto captions, and auto captions are bad automatic captions. So the caption engines are, engines are getting better at dealing with accents and languages other than English and really super technical terms, but they're also still not awesome. And if you're somebody who can't hear at all, like my friend Meryl, uh, you can see she's got uh, custom captions that she typed in herself on the left-hand side, where it says, I call them auto captions because they're riddled with mistakes. And on the right-hand side with YouTube automatic captioning, uh, YouTube automatic captioning thought she said, a possum or a question because the river was mistakes. So you can see you've just, it's garbage. You've completely lost the meaning of what it is that she said. So captions are, are cheap, for, you know, it's, it's low cost and high impact, okay? It's a curb cut. So curb cuts are things that were invented for people with disabilities that actually help people without disabilities. You know, so those that, they're those little dips that help you get somebody in a wheelchair like me get from one side of the street to the other side of the street. Um, when I was a kid, before the Americans with Disabilities Act, my mother couldn't take me anywhere. Uh, you know, she's five foot three and 105 pounds soaking wet. And me plus my wheelchair plus my casts were about 200 pounds and there were no curb cuts. So great, they created curb cuts and now I can get across the street by myself. But who uses them? Well, yes, I can use them. People with bicycles, skateboards and scooters use them. Amazon delivery people use them. People pulling luggage use them. People pushing baby strollers use them. So like probably 99% of the users are non-disabled but they were built with disabled uh, people in mind. Same thing with Siri. Siri was intended to be built for people with disabilities. And it ended up being that like everybody in the world who's got an iPhone uses Siri now. So um, people who watch captions aren't just people with hearing loss. People with hearing loss are about one third of people who use captions. Two thirds of the users are people who are English language learners people who are listening in a noisy environment or who forgot their headphones, and people who just learn better visually um, rather than through sound. So when you add captions to your videos for a buck a minute, that's literally all it costs, you're helping people with hearing loss, you're complying with the WCAG, but you're opening up your market to all these people without disabilities who use captions as well. And there's some very good statistics that show that people who turn on the captions for video are more likely to stay to the end of the video and they're like four times more likely to become a customer if it's in a retail environment. Um, so that directly converts into customer lifetime value. Okay, next slide. So next slide is a good example and a bad example of color contrast. So the way color contrast works is there's a ratio that's calculated between the strength of the foreground color and the strength of the background color. A color on itself is one, 
Black on white is 21. Everything else is somewhere in between the middle. The example on the right, people swear to me that there's yellow on this page. I literally don't see it. I, I see a little bit of blue and a little bit of blue green. I don't see any yellow. I also have glaucoma. Uh, the rose colored glasses don't work for me, unfortunately. So uh, the color contrast on the right is about 1.15 to one. The minimum standard to meet the accessibility guidelines is three. And you don't need to understand how the math works because there are free tools that will do the math for you. So Stark, a company called Stark has um, built-ins for Figma for example, where you can put in the colors that you're using and it tells you what the ratios are. Um, the, another one that I like is the Pass Yellow Group Color Contrast Analyzer. That one uh, does the same. You, you can either type in the hex code for the color or you can sample a pixel of the foreground and a pixel of the background and it does the math for you and it tells you whether you've passed or failed. Okay, cutoff is three. So what that means is one seventh of potential color combinations are not allowed, okay? And then some of those things would include pastels because they don't have good contrast on, on light backgrounds. Um, color on color, for example, if you've got tan on a mahogany background or light blue on a dark blue background, those are problematic because there's not enough color contrast because they're from the same color families. And gray has to be saturated at 60% or above in order to be compliant. Anything below 60% of saturation is too small for people to see. On a side note, people ask me all the time, what's the minimum font size for uh, accessibility? And the answer is there isn't one. Because if you've got good enough contrast and you support magnification, which we'll be talking about in one of the coming up slides, then you should be fine. It doesn't matter what font size you have as your default because the person with the disability, if they need a larger font, they can work around it. So there's no rule about, you know, you have to be 12 point or you have to be, you know, whatever. It's just, you have to support the contrast rules and you have to support the uh, magnification rules. So next slide pertaining to color is color blindness. And I have a shot here of a football game, a rather infamous football game from about five years ago was when the NFL was trying to sell more jerseys. And so they changed up the jerseys for the Buffalo Bills, and I'm not even sure who the other team is. Um, what it looks like on the right-hand side is through colorblindness simulation. So red-green colorblindness is the most common form of colorblindness, and it means that the people who have that can't distinguish between red and green. So they couldn't see really helmet logos. The colors, red and green, look the same to them. They just kind of look like this blah, khaki sort of color. Um, and they couldn't see the team name. So they had no idea of who was winning or who was losing. Well, colorblindness is an X-linked trait. So that means that it's much, much more likely for men to get colorblindness than it is for women. Women typically are carriers, but men are the ones who actually experience the colorblindness. So 80% of their audience is colorblind because NFL is 80% uh, male audience. That means 6.5% of their viewers were seeing the, the, uh, the box with the colorblindness simulation on the right-hand side. That is not a small number of people. So uh, you don't ever wanna use red and green together, and you don't want to use either red or green on dark backgrounds. So another one that just happened recently, Coca-Cola Zero came out with this new you know, spiffy can that they're all, you know, isn't this the best thing ever? And it's red on black. You know, if you run it through this colorblindness simulation, you can't even see the logo. Um, stoplight charts are the are the place where this shows up most, most frequently because we use red, yellow, and green to indicate whether something is good, you know, it's a warning or it's bad. So when you're doing stoplight charts, you need to add something to go with the color in case the people can't understand, they don't perceive color the same way uh, that uh, non-colorblind people do. So we've added language, we've added patterns. Uh, we're in the process of putting together standardized guidelines so that everybody will do it the same way. But uh, this is something where it's really important that it's got to be color plus. You never want color by itself to indicate something's importance or to indicate information that's valuable that can't be derived uh, from anything else. 
Next slide. So this is the magnification slide. Uh, dynamic fonts are super important because if you use a dynamic font, when you resize it, it will resize itself without blurring. If you use fonts that are embedded inside text and then uh, expand those, uh, the edges get really blurry. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience, after reading something that looks like on the left-hand side for 15 or 20 minutes, I've usually got a headache for the rest of the day. So there are five times as many magnification users as screen reader users. So about 0.3% of the population use screen readers. And that means they're completely blind and they're relying on, on sound to tell them what the page says. But one and a half percent of people use magnification. If you've ever used pinch to zoom, congratulations, you've you've used assistive technology. That's that's where most magnification comes from, although you can also use control plus on your browser, or you can use a magnification tool like Zoom Text uh, as, as a native app on either your Mac or your PC. So you don't want to embed uh, text inside graphics, and you want to use dynamic fonts. <coughs> Preferably, it would actually be a font uh, without all of these serifs, which are these little dangly bits across the top and the bottom. So in a couple of slides, or maybe even the next slide, we're going to talk about the needs of people with dyslexia. So people who have dyslexia really struggle with justified text. Um, and the reason why that is, is because they have to jump from one side of the line to the next side of the line over these rivers of text that get created by the justification process. And it's inconsistent word spacing. And consistent word spacing is really important for people with dyslexia to be able to decode, which is you know, kind of what they call reading. Um, and the simpler the font, the easier it is for somebody with dyslexia to be able to read it. So if you're using some super, super fancy script, chances are somebody with dyslexia isn't going to be able to read it. If you're using something like the text that was on the previous page, they'll be able to read it, but they will read it much more slowly. So um, I did studies at one of my previous jobs where we found that people with dyslexia uh, read three times as fast with a uh, sans serif font and also they um, felt more comfortable with the reading. They didn't feel well, like the struggle was less. Um, so it is pretty critical. It is not necessarily critical to use a dyslexia friendly font. There are some fonts that were specifically designed with people with dyslexia in mind. People with dyslexia, if they wanna use those fonts, frequently they're sophisticated enough that they'll just hack their CSS sheet and just reprogram it all to that font. So the best thing you can do is a dynamic sans serif font and don't write justify. Uh, next slide is we definitely need to provide people who can't see text alternatives to visuals. So when you have a picture, you have to look at the text that's around it and you have to say, ask yourself the question, does what's in this picture add any value? to the text. If it doesn't add any value, then you set a field called the alt text to null. Okay, so you, you deliberately set it to be empty. That tells the screen reader, hey, when you hit this graphic, pretend this graphic isn't here, just skip over it. Otherwise, if it does add value, you, you need to describe it so that somebody who can, can't see is still experiencing your web page the same way as everybody else does. So I've got some examples here of some potential things that you could call this graphic, and it's a picture of George Washington uh, with text because of his role as the commander in chief of American forces in the Revolutionary War, and later the first president of the United States, George Washington is often called the father of his country. So uh, is image of George Washington good alt text? And the answer is no, because you never need to say image of or picture of the screen readers take care of that for you because it informs the screen reader user that it's a graphic. Do you want to say George Washington, the first president of the United States? No. Why? Because that's in the text. It says George Washington is later. He was the first president of the United States. So that's redundant information. It will slow down your screen reader users. It will make them cranky. 
So that's not acceptable alt text. So the two things that are possible here is one is an empty alt attribute. So you're deliberately saying, hey, this picture is only here to be decorative. It's not adding any information. Or you could just say George Washington. And when the, what a screen reader user will hear is graphic George Washington. So that's why you don't need to do image of or picture of or graphic in, at the beginning of your alt text because the screen reader takes care of that for you. All right, next slide. So this is just a preview of maybe a quarter of the WCAG guidelines. I can do a deeper dive on behavior if you want, um, but accessibility is really about choosing to make these things important up front choosing to make accessibility part of your MVP. Um, you don't want to do it at the end of a project. You want to design it in from the beginning and include it all along. And really, the most mature companies with respect to accessibility, and that would include companies like Adobe and Microsoft and Google, they have accessibility baked into the DNA of the entire organization. So accessibility isn't just about the accessibility team. It's about having an environment that supports employees with disabilities so that employees with disabilities feel comfortable talking about their disabilities. And they will raise their voices in the room saying, have you thought about accessibility when the accessibility team isn't there? Uh, to, to raise the voice because we can't be in all the meetings all the time. Even uh, with a, uh, a company the size of VMware, we have a huge accessibility organization by, by most measurements. We have 20 accessibility team members. I can only think of maybe six companies who have larger accessibility teams than we do uh, that are in uh, a tech company. Um, we have 35,000 employees. So we're not in all the meetings and and people who are in the meetings don't don't necessarily even know that VMware has an accessibility team. So it's critical that other employees with disabilities feel supported in the environment and feel comfortable raising their voices. And that's how you get accessibility built into products. Are there any other questions or any other accessibility discussions that you might want to have since we've got a little bit of time left over? I'm, I'm open to discuss just about anything. Yeah, um, there's only a handful of us here. So if anyone wants to request to come off of um, mute or share their video, you're welcome to do that or just post a question. It looks like Tyler had a question. Uh, where do we find guidelines to use as we are creating software to make it accessible? And Tyler, are you a VMware employee or not? He is. Um, Tyler actually works on the SALT project. Okay. So if you were at inside VMware, inside the firewall, if you type go accessibility, go slash accessibility in any browser where the VPN is connected, it will take you to the accessibility homepage, which will take you to all of our training materials, our champions program, um, all kinds of stuff. We also have accessibility as part of the cloud architecture forum. So if you go to the Cloud Architecture Forum homepage, there's a section on a project called Maya Lin, and that's M-A-Y-A-L-I-N. It's, it's two words, but it's, it's run together because I didn't think Project Maya was long enough. So the rule in the Cloud Architecture Forum is you have to name your projects after an architect. And Maya Lin is my personal favorite architect. Uh, she designed the Vietnam War Memorial um, and the Martin Luther King Reflection Pond, amongst other things. And um, I think she's a brilliant architect. And so I named my project um, after her. So uh, go, go to Octo, go into the Cloud Architecture Forum, and then look for uh, Project Maya Lin. And you'll find all the things that we're doing to help standardize the approach to accessibility at VMware. Because it's not enough for two products to be compliant if they're accessible in completely different manners. The first three years, so we started the accessibility uh, project at VMware, I was accessibility employee number one almost three years ago. Uh, it was just make it better, right? Because we had 1,200 bugs in vSphere. We had more than 1,800 bugs in the Horizon suite. We just had an astronomical number of defects because we'd been kicking the accessibility can down the road and we just wanted to make it better. And we didn't focus too much 
on, well, let's wait until we've got a standardized approach internally. So now we're working on getting a standardized approach. And then as products get updated, we will be making sure that that approach is, is applied. Um, and the standardized approach at VMware will include best practices in accessibility. It won't just include um, the accessibility guidelines. And we will have some automated tests that we're working on right now that will be run uh, as part of the uh, CICD pipeline, and it will tell people where they're not following the best practices. So that was probably a longer answer than you expected, uh, but you know, I think it's a pretty awesome answer because it's really hard to test things that are so inherently visual in an automated manner. Um, and so we've done some really interesting machine learning and uh, pattern recognition and image matching uh, to, to help do a better job at that and lower our reliance on manual testing because manual testing is super time intensive and it's not great for being in a SaaS environment. So um, it looks like Taylor had a follow-up question to that and it actually feeds into that pretty well, I think. So he's wondering what do accessibility requirements look like for CLI tools like SALT and ITEM? So for a CLI tool, only six of the 50 guidelines apply. Um, if you go to the website, uh, the vmware.com website, we do have what we call VPATS. So VPAT stands for Vo Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. It's the paperwork that you have to do for the government to prove whether or not something is accessible. And only six of the 50 rules apply to CLI. So it's, you know, can you input from a keyboard? What do the error messages look like? Are you using the right colors? Are you supporting the user's assistive technology? It's, it's really straightforward. You don't have to worry about things like radio buttons and menu organization um, and shopping cart updates because none of that stuff applies to CLI. Okay, great. I wonder if it'd be helpful if we could compile like a list of internal links for folks. Um, I've posted the WCAG a lot of, guidelines a lot as well. Of that's yeah, a lot of that's already on the go slash accessibility page. So that that's a good starting point. And if you can't find that, um, let me know and I'll, I'll point you to the deep link. Perfect. What other questions do we have? Yeah, just to expand on the answer to Tyler, um, people, especially people who are blind, prefer a CLI interface. Um, because they don't want to have to deal with sitting there and listening uh, to, to the entire page announce and then, and then choose their options from there. Uh, people who are blind will interact on a CLI about five times as fast as they will execute the same information uh, through a user interface, even a perfectly accessible user interface. Um, so CLIs, big thumbs up uh, for accessibility. They're always a good thing when you can provide them. The problem is... When I started, for example, we had this Power CLI, and everybody thought, oh, Power CLI, great. We don't have to make the vSphere UI accessible because we can give people the Power CLI as the alternative. Well, it turns out somewhere along the way, somebody had made the decision to use not just the public API calls, but also protected and private API calls within vSphere. And that meant that the CLI was no longer an equivalent experience because the CLI only gets the public API calls. So if you really want your CLI to be equivalent, only use public APIs in your UI. I hope that wasn't too nerdy because oh, you never so. know who you're gonna get on these calls. <laughs> yeah, Tyler says that helps a lot. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks for the question. That was a really good one. And I actually didn't know the answer to that either. Um, and what else? Chris, Chris Lane. So CH Lane is his login. He is your CLI accessibility guru. Reach out to him anytime uh, you have a CLI accessibility question. He'll be able to help you. Any other questions? Um, that's it so far. Any others from the group? All right, well, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you're inside VMware, you know where to find me. If you're outside VMware, I'm the only Bern Haber that I know of on LinkedIn. 
Um, I've got an enormous medium blog uh, with lots and lots and lots of, of back history of my, my thoughts about uh, accessibility, including analyzing most of the legal decisions that have come out because, you know, I'm dangerous. I'm a lawyer with a CS degree. So <laughs> I kind of spend my life translating between those two worlds. Um, but always happy to support people, um, even if they're outside VMware. Don't, don't let that stop you from contacting me. Thanks so much for presenting. This has been really helpful, Sherry. Oh, thanks for uh, taking care of driving the deck for me, Serena. Yeah, I mean, even though I uh, was just sharing the wrong screen for probably 10 minutes, that's okay. <laughs> like I said, the deck really isn't that important. It's just more about keeping me on track. <laughs> Thank you all for joining. Um, we've got some people saying thanks in the comments. I hope you all have a great rest of your day at SaltConf today. Yep, enjoy.